Hey, um, let's uh, let's talk about ancient Greek philosophy. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be studying the philosophy of the ancient Greeks, which means we're gonna be studying uh, texts uh, from about twenty five hundred years ago. And uh, I want to talk about those texts. I'll do that in a few minutes. Uh, but but first, to, to, in order to approach that, I actually want to talk for a second about that idea of 2,500 years ago. Uh, I want to think a little bit about what that means. Um, and to do that, uh, I want to, you know, 2,500 years is five 500 year units. And I want to look at, I want to look at that in terms of going back in 500 year units, just to try to get a sense of what 2,500 years ago means. So first, you know, if you go back 500 years from this year, 2020, that takes you to about 1500. So what was happening around 1500? Well, I think probably the most striking thing is that uh, that's when the Europeans discovered North America, right? That Columbus um, sailed in 1492. And that's really the beginning of European colonialism, glo the global spread of the European powers um, uh, that defined that has that has brought into being our contemporary culture right we live in the world that is a consequence of the Spanish the Portuguese the Dutch the English and the French uh, sailing out with you know guns and other things around the globe uh, to take power in and take possession of lands all over the place that they you know, primarily for the purpose of economic exploitation. Um, that's, that's, that's what brought into being the society, the culture we currently live in. So if we go back 500 years, we're going back to the time before this culture existed. Right? It's, it's, it's the time when the thing that for us is just the uh, unquestioned everyday reality uh, hadn't yet happened and was being brought into being. And indeed, for people like me who live in North America, there was no European civilization here at that time. So I'm living in a, in, in a culture that uh, was really inaugurated by Columbus coming over here and, and bringing Europe to the shores of, of North America. So that's, that's 500 years. Um, uh, that's, where our, that's when our modern world was really being born, being launched. Let's go 500 years before that. What happens if you take 500 years away from 1500? That's, that would take you to around 1000. What was going on there? Well, there, uh, 1095, uh, is the beginning of the Crusades. Right? So that's when uh, European armies were basically invading the, uh, what we now call the Middle East. Um, in order to uh, re, re, reconquer the Holy Lands from the Muslims who occupied them. And so that's, uh, that's, that's part of the, um, that's really the, the kind of the height of the Middle Ages, what we call the Middle Ages um, in Europe. Uh, in the Muslim world, the, the world that the Christians were invading, uh, 1000 is a kind of a significant time there too, around 950, it was a little bit before 1000. The... Um, the massive Muslim empire, which ran all the way in the west from Spain, across North Africa, through the Middle East and into Asia, that massive empire that had uh, lasted for centuries was was breaking up. And around 950, that that um, that empire was breaking up into smaller, uh, sort of rebellious mini empires that fought with each other and to some extent and, and basically broke away and, and made that thing no longer a, a unity. Um, uh, so so that's, that, that's, the, that's the kind of the height of the Middle Ages in both the Christian and the Muslim worlds. Um, uh, go back 500 years before that um, and what do you have? Uh, um, that would be 500 AD. Well, that's kind of the beginning of the Middle Ages so-called Middle Ages, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, what do we mean by the Middle Ages? Well, that's a, that's a ridiculous name, the Middle Ages. Middle of what? Well, we mean between the end of the ancient world and the beginning of the modern world. That's, that's why we name it that way. Uh, um, 
and so that 500 500 BC is basically the end of the ancient world uh, you know there's no there's no uh, actual date when those things begin or end it you know but why why would I say 500 well because in 410 uh, the city of Rome was sacked and you know, up until that time Rome had been the powerful center of this massive empire the Roman Empire which controlled Europe and North Africa and again into Asia and so on Middle East um, and you know the, the, then the the uh, the armies of Rome had controlled that and and kept you know other peoples out at the boundaries. So what what happened in 410 is that the 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 people they used to keep out in this case the Germanic peoples from Eastern Europe and Central Asia were had pushed through those boundaries and were overrunning the the former Roman Empire and so much so that they could actually seize and sack uh, the the illustrious capital of that um, so five that's four four ten so around 500 if we're using our 500 year units around 500 we're basically witnessing the end of that ancient world and this empire that had lasted for thousands of years or sorry not thousands hundreds of years um, and uh, and the beginning of then a new period the one we're going to call the middle age that is commonly commonly called the middle ages and that begins in Europe with what was what is often called the Dark Ages, because the the end of Roman power kind of meant the end of developed civilization across Europe. Uh, and so, between then and that other date, in the beginning of the Crusades, um, it was a very very slow process of the resuscitation of a culture in Europe. Uh, in in the Muslim world, things are quite different. I mean, the Muslim world begins around that time. So, you know, we're going back to 500. Well, 570, maybe, is when the Prophet Muhammad was born. So the Muslim world really has its birth right around that time, just, a, you know, a little bit later. So this is the beginning of centuries of that um, huge and powerful culture that, again, was starting to fall apart around a thousand uh, so that's but anyway so that's what's happening at 500 let's go back 500 years before that where we get to zero why do we call it year zero well because we're uh, in this culture we date things uh, Christianly so in the Christian calendar uh, the year zero is the year zero because that's taken to be the year of Jesus, the birth of Jesus Christ um, so you know we can talk about we could talk about what's good or bad about using that sort of calendar, but th th we'll leave that aside here. Uh, but so sticking sticking with that calendar, zero is going to be when Jesus died. That's also when around the time when Julius Caesar was assassinated, um, and uh, and a little bit later Augustus uh, came to the throne, and that so that's when people that's what people officially call the beginning of the Roman Empire. In fact, um, uh, Ro uh, Rome had been expanding its power already quite a ways outside of Rome and Italy uh, before that. But they don't call it the empire before that because of the, the way it was governed and so on. But in any case, that's, that's what's happening at zero. Caesar's assassinated, not right at zero, but in that era. Caesar was assassinated, Augustus came to power, Jesus was born. Um, so that's that's sort of where you're getting to when you go back another 500 years from the end of the Roman Empire. We go back 500 years before that, 500 years before well BC, before Christ, in that in that way of counting things. Um, that's the culture we're going to, right? And and that's the so for that culture, there's no such thing as Christians. There's no such thing as Muslims. Uh, the Greeks probably didn't even particularly know about Rome. Um, uh, um, uh, certainly no printing press, certainly no cell phones, uh, no international trade agreements, no, um, no uh, local, uh, you know, no, no networks of branch banks, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I, like, I'm just trying to get you to think of all the things you have to take away from your world to get back there. Um, not for the purpose of saying that's primitive or anything like that, rather for the purpose of getting you to start noticing how much that pr the process of those 2,500 years have produced 
these things around you that you take for granted, right? And so, so I want you to try to then to think, oh, we're going back to a world without those things, and that's that's how far back we're going. Um, I want to say something, well, a few other things about that in a minute, but first I want to uh, go back another 500 years. So, so first of all, so where are we when, we when we go to 500 BC? Well, that's roughly the culture we're going to study, roughly, uh, and that's also the time. Uh, roughly of the birth of the Buddha in in the north east India, what we now call India. Um, uh, it's roughly the time when the beginning chapters, you know, uh, of the Book of Genesis were being written. Uh, it's probably again also in the in the Hebrew uh, scriptures. That's probably roughly the time of uh, the Book of Jeremiah. I would think somewhere around there. Um, but so that's. There's some things around 500 where we're going. We go 500 years before that, and uh, and we we go somewhere else. 500 years before that is uh, up uh, as as long as we go back to 500 BC, that where we're going. Like we have written history about that and so on. Uh, that that's that's those are earlier parts of of a story that's continuously told in our history and our culture. You go back 500 years before that to 1000 BC, and that changes. There you're going to the world that we know an awful lot about, but we know about it through archaeology primarily and through things that are carried forward from that culture, but they aren't historical writings. They're, they're oral tales. They're, they're, they're uh, or, oral traditions that were handed down, um, and, and those were the ways that people preserved a sense of themselves and their culture. So what are those oral tales? Things like Homer's Iliad, right, the story of the Trojan War, or in the Hebrew writings, Hebrew scriptures, things like the rest of the book of Genesis after the beginning, or the book of Exodus, those those stories of um, Abraham and Moses are those traditional tales handed down over generations. Um, and th those are from that world, you know, back around 1000 AD, and they're about that that world, but the, uh, you know. Uh, so that's, that's what's happening at 1000. So between a thousand BC and 500 BC, where we're going, actually a pretty big change took place. Uh, we went from that world of archaeology and no, known through archaeology and the preserved oral traditions. We come to this world of historical writing and everything else, and and other things. Um, and so I want you to notice that. So that, let me now quickly just say if you, what it is that I'm wanting you to notice from these things and try to pull it together. Um, uh, like on, on the one hand, I want you to notice that when we're going back to 500 BC that we're talking about people who are quite different from us for the very reasons that, well, for the reasons I already said. They don't have cell phones. They don't. They don't uh, have uh, maps. They don't have world maps. Uh, they don't have international trade agreements. They've never heard of Christians and Muslims. Uh, various other things. Um, uh, so in those ways, they're they're kind of they're they're quite different from us, and and so. It's important for you to notice that because it's it's important for you to try to see something about how much you take for granted in your everyday perspective. You live in the world where all that twenty five hundred years of things have happened, and and the developments of those twenty five hundred years shape how you think about things. Right? And so it's an it's an exercise for you to try to be able to think with people who don't have all the assumptions and, and whatever else that come from living with the historical accomplishments of those subsequent 2,500 years. Um, so that's the point about saying we're going to get to people who are different. On the other hand, uh, as I said a minute ago, there. We, when you go back here, these people are kind of the same of, as us in a way that when you read the traditional tales about the Homer, the, the Homer's tales about the Trojan War, or when you read about the stories in Exodus or, or Genesis, there it doesn't feel like you're reading about the same kind of culture we live in. So, so yeah, the Greeks, ancient Greeks of 500 BC, they're not the same culture of us in the way that our culture is that one inaugurated by Columbus, right? So I, that's a I was already saying that's a way they're different, but they are part of our culture in the sense that they're still part of that same story. Like they're they're part of the making of the culture that we continue to live in. In a way that 
such that we can feel like oh they're, they're, we're the same kind of people as they are in a way that you don't I don't think you feel that when you read about the heroes in the Trojan War and so on. Um, well, that's then a big point. The thing about ancient Greece is that it's revolutionary. It it is the society that um, embodies a, a a major kind of revolution in human history, and the reason that we study the Greeks so much in so many disciplines is because uh, um, that culture accomplished and, and literally brought into being so many things that remain the basic sort of pillars and structures of our our way of living, what, what we think it means to be people living in the world. So, so you know, when I say the Greeks in a certain sense are the same as us, that's not just an... Uh, it's not just an interesting kind of little observation. It's actually a little bit more important than that. What, what I really want you to see is in the Greeks, we're seeing the inauguration of a lot of things that we take for granted. And it's important to bring that perspective analogous, analogously to the way that it's important to try to take out of your perspective all the assumptions that come with living with 2,500 years of accomplishments. It's important to bring that this 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 uh, this kind of perspective, um, because uh, when you can relate to the things that are being studied in these books, in as kind of inaugural movements, uh, in a way you can see them better, and you can think, oh yeah, what what is this thing that's being brought into being? So so the Greeks brought into, brought into being things like, you know, pretty big things, historical writing. The reason we can trace history back to that time is because they more or less invi invented the real writing of, you know, systematic, rigorous scientific history. History in, this, in the sense we know it would now take it up if you studied a class in history. You don't really find that anywhere else in the world before the Greeks of this culture started doing that, and writers like Herodotus and Thucydides, those are the, the big famous ones that are preserved. There are various other writers too. Um, uh, what else did they inaugurate? Well, more or less the thing we're going to do in this class, the practice of philosophy. And f philosophy in the really rich sense, not just of you know philosophizing about this or that topic, but in the sense of um, that whole questioning attitude towards the world and what it is and how to understand it that that is that lies behind science in in the broadest sense scientific inquiry inquiry you know um, yeah scientific inquiry in the broadest sense um, that that the basic notion of uh, the basic attitude of philosophy is pretty much something that comes out of the Greeks too and and the more precise sense in which that's true is is what I'm in a few minutes going to be going on to try to show you um, and uh, third, uh, the ancient Greeks more or less invented again the, th the thing that we think of as a political community. Politics is pretty much a thing that came out of that Greek culture. Politics and the sort of related notion of democracy. It's hard for us, surely it's hard for us to imagine a world without politics, science, and history. But before 500 BC in Greece, that you did have a world largely without those things. Um, you have other things in all in all kinds of cultures that have some some connection with those things. But that the 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 reality of those distinctive human practices as things to be taken up and pursued in their own right and so on that's really something that comes from the Greeks, and and in that sense we we are all Greeks uh, all over the world because we. In all of our modern cultures, we live from, we utterly depend upon um, the sort of belief in and commitment to those kinds of practices that, that were brought on the stage by the Greeks. So that's in a way what we're doing when we're studying ancient Greek philosophy. We're studying the philosophy in and of that culture that was bringing into existence um, those really foundational human practices that um, 
continue to define for us really basically what what we take it to mean to to live in a human world and to live in a human culture so that's what that's what we're going to be studying so um so anyway that's that's just a quick attempt a very quick attempt to give you a a little sense of what 2500 years ago means and a little sense of what 500 bc in ancient in ancient greece uh means so let's go on and talk about this so um so I want to begin by talking about uh, um, uh, a few uh, writers. Uh, uh, we're not going to spend very much time on them. We're going to just very quickly look at a few things these guys said. They're all worthy of much more substantial study, but we're, I'm just going to whip through them because I really want to just take out of them one core idea before we get on to um, our main study, which is going to be the study of Plato and Aristotle. Uh, the, who Plato and Aristotle, who wrote actually more like between say uh, 400 and 300 BC, not 500 BC, uh, but Plato's writings in particular are largely about a particular guy, a guy named Socrates, who lived from uh, roughly 469 BC to 399 BC. So closer to he was born closer to 500, 469, uh, and. Uh, and so we're going to be thinking and talking about him a lot. So we're really going to be looking at um, philosophy from you know roughly 469 BC to about 330 BC, something in that range. Um, you don't need to know that, but 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 it's the it's the philosophy that grew out of that culture that was really really thriving around 500 BC. Um, but yeah, but bef but but we're going to start by looking at these figures who come before that guy Socrates. And so they're often called pre-Socratic philosophers, which they are. They're philosophers from before Socrates. But that's a little bit like calling um, Greek philosophy pre-Christian philosophy or pre-Muslim philosophy. It it's, remains true in a kind of factual way. But when you talk about things that way, you've already chosen, you've sort of chosen to say what defines them is this thing, Socrates or Christianity or Islam. Uh, and so when we call these people, I'm going to talk about pre-Socratic philosophers, it makes it seem like um, they're sort of meaningfully defined by the important fact that they were before Socrates. And I'm not sure that that's true. I, I, I'm just going to say that to you because you're going to see that designation all the time as you study ancient philosophy, or if you study it. And I want to alert you to the possibly prejudicial way of, well, not even possibly, the prejudicial way of talking about of thinking about things that is involved in talking that way, as it would be prejudicial to call uh, Plato uh, an example of you know pre-Christian philosophy or pre-Muslim philosophy, and uh, you know as it's prejudicial to say year zero is the year is is when Jesus was born or or that this was even as I have said 500 B.C. i.e. before before Christ. Um, it's not false, but it's a, it's a decision about how to name time and how to understand time. So I just want you to be thinking about that, uh, about uh, about that way of entering into th to thinking about figures in history and so on. Anyway, but but, but so we are going to study the a little bit these these uh, three pre-Socratic philosophers first, and th those are uh, Heraclitus um, of Ephesus, Parmenides of Elia. Uh, and uh, Pythagoras, um, I guess we would say Pythagoras of Samos, um, but in each case saying where they're, where they're from. Um, uh, so we're gonna, uh, I want to start with this guy uh, Heraclitus from Ephesus, and I'm going to just show you a little map here. Um, th this is a, a map of the ancient Greek world. Ancient Greece is all that uh, sort of pink stuff. And so you can see that um, to a significant degree, when we talk about ancient Greece, we are talking about things that are in that area of land that in the modern world we call Greece, but also in significant ways that it's not there. So there's a lot of pink around what modern Turkey or what we also call Anatolia, the Anatolian Peninsula. Um, but so you can see a lot of a lot of Greece is on the shores of Anatolia or Turkey, uh, and even in the it's, it goes over into Italy and even over into France and and Spain. Those are those are um, uh, Greek colonies. Um, um, so uh, Heraclitus is from part of uh, 
the Greek call the Greek settlements in Anatolia. He's from a place called Ephesus, um, uh, which is a little place in Turkey um, that has been there was significant many times in history. It was significant initially as this Greek place, later as a Roman place, later as a Christian place. Um, and you can go there. There are there are some really amazing um, ruins and things there. It's a great place to visit. Um, but anyway, that's where Heraclitus was from. Uh, there's not a big there's not a big deal attached to that um, uh, to me mentioning that those geographical things. But I do want you to be aware that when we're talking about ancient Greece, we're talking about a culture, but not a, not not a place that corresponds to our current country called Greece. Though it's though there's it's quite similar. Uh, but so, but but you know, Heraclitus was actually in in the modern sense from Turkey. But he was part of the Greek culture. He was part of people who thought of themselves as more or less the same cultural kind of people. They spoke roughly the same language. They believed roughly the same. They they talked about roughly the same gods. Had roughly the same religious practices and so on. And, and they so they thought of themselves as a culture. Um, but they didn't have a national government, uh, which is one of the things I think that we'll probably talk about at some point. Anyway, we're going to talk about this guy. He was born, um, I think that his the estimate is birth at about 540 BC uh, in Ephesus. Um, so I just want to uh, read a few of his passages and talk about them. Um, we're, we're reading from, uh, the selections I'm taking are from this Hackett book, A Pre-Socratics Reader. It's a collection and translation of a lot of pre-Socratic writings. Um, I, don't, I don't know of any such collection that I think is that good um, for for various reasons, largely because they're all the translations all have um, bring with, with them a lot of interpretive baggage and when you don't also have the Greek to work on um, these can be very misleading and so on, but I'm not going to worry about that because we're not going to pursue Heraclitus that deeply, so let's just, but let's just read a few things he says um, uh, so he says so I'm going to, I'm going to read, I'm going to tell you the numbers of the passages we're going to read from this reader but they're they're also there's a more standard way they're numbered which is they're they're numbered according to uh, a, a book by deals uh, uh, where these fra the these ancient fragments of these ancient writings were all collected and and so on uh, so it has a it has a number from the from the deals crans edition um, so this so we're going to start with what in this book is numbered one, but in Deals Krantz is, is uh, number 22B1. Uh, and I mention that because if you're ever involved in any kind of serious conversation about ancient philosophy, you have to know the standard ways of referring to these. So it wouldn't mean anything to call this fragment one to anybody else, because that just happens to be how it's put in this book. But it would mean something to call it 22B1. That's the standard reference. Anyway, so Heraclitus says this. Um, he says, and right off the bat, it's going to be a word you don't know. He says, although this logos holds always, humans prove unable to understand it, both before hearing it and when they have and when they have first heard it. For although all things come to be in accordance with this logos, humans are like the inexperienced when they experience such words and deeds as I set out, etc., etc. Um, uh, so. Uh, I want you just to notice initially these two parts. This logos holds always, and all things come to be in accordance with this logos. We'll have reason to talk about the Greek word logos later uh, uh, more. Uh, but for the moment, let's just say, you know, it roughly means something like um, reason or principle. So he's saying all, all things come to be in accordance with, with this grounding principle or this this fundamental uh, cause or reason that's roughly what he means by logos here so this logos holds always like this this reason is the is what is the ultimate cause or principle that always holds and all things come to be in accord in accordance with this principle this core reality um, and then he says, um, but then, but then he says, so we're going to come back and talk about what that is in a moment. But then, but remember, notice he says, uh, humans prove unable to understand it, both before hearing it and when they have heard, and when they have first heard it. 
and uh, humans are like the inexperienced, inexperienced when they experience such words and deeds as I set out. Um, so let's carry on with that theme for a minute. So now fragment 8 in this book, which is uh, fragment B104. He says, um, what, what understanding or intelligence have they? Most people. Uh, they put their trust in popular bards and tape, take the mob for their teacher. Uh, a little bit more. Number uh, 13. Eyes and ears are bad witnesses to people if they have barbarian souls. That was B107. Number 15, which is B34. Uncomprehending when having heard, they are like the deaf. The saying describes them. Being present, they are absent. Um, so that's, that's enough. Um, so, so Heraclitus is saying, you know, there's a logos, there's a principle that holds always, and all things come to be in accordance with it. But people don't understand it. Um, instead, what they do is they trust in popular bards, bards and take the mob for their teacher. Well, in other words, he's saying, you know, people, people get their understanding from, you know, in, in this case, you know, traditional poems. In our case, you know, it shows you watch on TV. You know, you watch, you watch a lots of movies about and TV shows about people doing things in the world, and those things kind of present present you with a, a vision and a kind of interpretation of the way things are, and, and that's kind of how you get your education. That's kind of how you learn what things go on in the world and how to understand them. And he says, uh, they take the mob for their teacher. Yeah, like we we generally come to think on the basis of what we pick up from popular opinion. And, and in fact, I said movies and TVs. Maybe I really should have said even pop songs. Like, how many people, maybe you, how many people hear in pop songs things where they think yeah that's my experience and the the lyrics of the song seem to explain their situation for, to them um well that's that's taking your guidance from bards and having the mob for your teacher um uh, a little bit more he says the, the one i said eyes and ears are bad witnesses to people if they have barbarian souls and then uncomprehending when they have heard they are like the deaf um so you know yeah we, we have eyes and ears. We look around and see things. But what he's saying is, you don't get what you're seeing. Now, so what? what is it that we should be getting? Well, this Logos holds always, and all things come to be in accordance with it. Um, so, he's, so the thing he's naming is kind of the ultimate character of things. And he's saying that we, we don't get that. Now, uh, uh, going back to these other fragments, uh, carrying on from where we were, let's look for a minute at um, number 11, which is B50. He says, listening, to, uh, listening not to me, but to the Logos, it's wise to agree that all things are one. So we're going we're gonna to learn from him. We're going to learn from his words. But his point is, his words are not just him privately speaking. You know, who cares what his personal thoughts are? Rather, what his words are doing is is giving voice to that that real principle, the logos. And so, what uh, if if you're actually trying to use your ears to hear the truth instead of what people usually hear, what would you hear? Well, listening not to me, but to the logos, it's wise to agree that all things are one. That that I think is the is the core point. What. Um, What is the thing he's saying where, where he's saying there's something really important that needs to be understood and most people don't get it? The, the, the simplest answer is all things are one. Um, I think there's one other passage I wanted. No, actually, that's good enough. Let's, let's just think about that idea for a second, that all things are one. Um, if you look around you, you wouldn't think that. You'd say, there's one thing and there's a different thing. There, I'm looking on my window here, I see a house, and then there's a different thing, which is a tree, 
And then a different thing, which is a recycling bin. And a different thing, which is a fence. You know, and I could go on. It doesn't seem that all things are one. And uh, it seems like all things are all things. Lots of many different things. Right? So, so our initial experience of the world is that I'm one thing in relationship to all kinds of other different things. Right? So we're initially struck by the discreteness of things and their difference from us. And that, and and part of what he's saying here is in, there's there's something really wrong there. Um, what is the thing he's noticing when he says that all things are one? Well, I, I think in in our simplest language th- that we are pretty familiar with and take for granted, he's saying at, you you need to have a a basic principle of let's say reality, reality as such. You know, yeah, that's a house and, and that's a tree, but, but there is a house and a tree there only because this is reality. And it's all one and the same reality. It's just the one and only reality that there is. Um, that's That, I think, is um, the really important thing he's trying to get you to notice and that he's saying in a way we often don't notice. Now, when I say that to you, I can say it pretty easily because I can say, look, there's this one and only reality. And, and I imagine you know what I mean. If I if I say in this course, one of the things we're going to study or we're going to talk about is the ultimate nature of reality. Or let me put that differently. I could say one of the things we're going to do, we're doing philosophy. One of the branches of philosophy is metaphysics. What do we mean by metaphysics? We mean uh, study of the ultimate nature of reality. Like when I when I say a sentence like that to you, probably you know what I mean. I presume you do. I'm going to say it as if you do. Um, well, that's what he's saying too. But but he's saying it when really nobody nobody else ever quite said something like that before. So yeah, you understand it when I say that, and you can say, okay, I know what you're talking about. Well, you, when you know what I'm talking about, and you can engage in that practice, that's you can do that because that practice was inaugurated 2,500 years ago. So at some level, yes, um, people surely have always had some meaningful relation to that question of the ultimate nature of reality. I think that's kind of the core core of a religious the, the motivation behind religion is is to try to grasp you know where we stand in relation to things and what the ultimate nature of things is and so on and, and say oh you know we have to you know we we need to worship God or whatever it is um, but that that uh, so in that way the thing Heraclitus is doing is is resonant with a, with a much much older practice that is religion in general so so he's not inventing he's not inventing the, the some kind of sense of concern with an awareness of the ultimate nature of things and so on that's that's as old as humanity but what he what he is doing that is new is is singling that out as a subject for explicit reflection and consideration taking it up not as a matter of worship but as a matter of inquiry Um, and so he's not saying oh man you know watch out god's going to get you he's 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 saying notice that um we we always live in the real that that there that whatever there is around you it itself it exists there is such a thing as existence you might say and we can ask, what is it to exist? Maybe that's a good, a good way to put it. You, you know, the, in the other language, I would say, what is it to be real? Or what is reality as such? What is reality as reality? Or So that's similar to asking, what is it to exist? And I think that's, I think that's what he's trying to get at here when, when he, he says, you know, um, uncomprehending when having heard they are like the death deaf or eyes and ears are bad witnesses to people if they have barbarian souls i mean i think i think he's saying there um yeah you see the house around you but you don't 
you don't you, it doesn't weigh on you that there's such a thing as existence why is there anything why is there existence well there is such a thing as existence and the the familiar fact that there's a house across the street from you in its very being rests upon the fact that there is being right and then we can say well, so what is it to be and to recognize oh my goodness i'm not just across the street from a house i am in the presence of being or i i i am in the midst of being right and that's and and that's what he wants you to, to get attention, pay attention to. So, you know, there's another passage in here. Um, it's number 55 in the book, which is uh, B84A in the Deals Krantz number. And he says, changing it rests. Notice here, you know, it's the wind. I, as I look out my window right now, I see a tree that's moving slightly. There's a gentle breeze moving it. So the tr tr the branches and the leaves are changing position a little bit the air is moving um, the sun is gradually going to be in a different position and the day is going to wear on and I don't know the guy across the street is renovating his house so it's changing you know, he's ripping down walls and putting up new ones and uh, going to charge his tenants a lot of money and stuff like that um, people somebody walks down the street you know somebody's there they're gone there's a lot of change right so you might think oh what's around me is just change but as he says changing it rests right reality has existence being has continued to be and you know in that changing the unchanging fact of existence is is kind of being realized right so um as all those things change what doesn't change is that it's still the same reality. It's still right there. It's still just as real as it was before. Right? Um, so I'm going to come back to Heraclitus in a minute, well, a couple of minutes. But I want to jump from that point to uh, Parmenides of Elia. Uh, Elia is uh, interesting. Then from it's from Italy, the place in, in modern day Italy. So it's another it's another Greek uh, colony, I guess. Um, uh, but so here's another ancient Greek philosopher. He is ancient Greek by virtue of culture and so on, but he's not from the area in the modern day that we would call Greece. Nothing's going to rest on that. I just want you to know that when you're trying to think about what we're doing. But so this is Parmenides from Elia. Um, and here, uh, with Heraclitus, uh, actually, let me say one more thing about that in order to introduce Parmenides. With Heraclitus, you know, you have all these little things, and they're sometimes called fragments. And and they some or all of them may be fragments in the sense of broken off pieces from something bigger but with with heraclitus at least and maybe with some of the other so-called pre-socratic philosophers uh, i think it can be misleading also to call these things fragments because i think many of these things look like more like aphorisms like little potent like little tweets you know little condensed powerful things he says in just a few characters and they weren't supposed to be bigger um so i i will almost certainly fall into calling them fragments because that's what everybody says um but but just like pre-socratic and pre-christian and bc and all the rest is i want you to notice that that way of talking has a kind of interpretation built into it and can be quite misleading but anyway so so with heraclitus we have these little aphorisms uh at least some of which may be fragmentary remains of a larger thing. Like that first one, number one, people say that's the beginning of his book. Again, that wouldn't be book in our modern sense. It would mean a, a little papyrus roll and probably pretty short. Um, but anyway, that's what, that's what we have here. With, with Parmenides, Parmenides of Elia, we have something a little bit different. He actually has a poem. And we have almost, well, it looks like almost all of it. In, uh, so we, this actually is fragments. We have fragments of this one big poem and we, there are a few bits missing but we have almost the whole poem reconstructed from some fragmentary remains uh he wrote uh, i said uh heraclitus was born around 540 bc uh parmenides was born around people imagine around 515 uh, bc so so uh 35 years later but anyway so in in parmenides poem um he's going to say some things that i think resonate pretty strongly with what I was just saying about Heraclitus. Um, so let me just um, begin with uh, fragment four, which is fragment B4. 
the second line there he says for you will not cut off what is from clinging to what is right so yeah you know you can you can you can take the curtain off the curtain rail right but you can't take being off being you know if i if i take the curtain rail off the curtain rail being remains completely continuous you don't you can't you can't pull a piece of reality out of reality right and I, I say that because well and he says that because i want you to start thinking about what it's like when you talk about reality as such reality as reality not just real things but what it is to be real what it is to be you can't take a you can't take being out of being you can't take a being out of being. You can take one being away from another being, but you can't take being out of being. There's no there's nowhere for it to go. And so that is, that's one of the things Parmenides says. He says, um, uh, uh, what is, uh, you, you, you want to note the truth that it is and that it is not possible for it not to be. When you're when you're talking about the ultimate nature of things, about reality, you have to recognize like it is, and it's not possible for it not to be. And on the other hand, there's no is not. There's no there's no alternative, which is some other thing, which would be non-being. That would just be nothing. So, you know, the all all of your thinking and speaking and interacting or whatever takes place within the context of what is. And all your easily easy distinctions between something that is and and something it isn't, the distinction between is and isn't, that makes sense when you're talking about beings. This being is and it isn't that other thing over there. So you can easily have is and is not. But those are terms that work within being, within reality. There aren't terms that work when you jump to the, talking about the context of being as such or reality as such. There you just have is. There's no, there is no is not. Um, yeah, so you, you so uh, back to number four there, you will not cut off what is from clinging to what is. And he says, um, well, actually, let me read, read another thing from six, which just goes back to the point I had been making when I read that thing from number two. So this is from B6. He says, it is right both to say and to think that what is, is, for it can be, but nothing is not. Right? So all we have is is. Um, and let me jump ahead now to number eight, which is fragment B8. And, and he says, to, and, and let's think then about what is. Let's think then about being or reality as such. Right? Not talk about a being or, or the many different beings that reflect our familiar way of dealing with the fact of reality that we've find ourselves in the midst of and part of but let's try to talk about reality as such reality on its own terms where we've already noticed that you can't you, you can't use the same terms or the same ways of thinking or categorizing when you move to the level of talking about reality as such it operates on different terms than than the terms that operate within reality and so let's continue with that he says in number eight the third line he says uh, what is is ungenerated and imperishable Whew. yeah because any um thing around you comes into being out of formerly not being like you built a house and there used to not be one there it came into being and it passes away it's going to perish um it's in that sense it's generated but reality didn't come from some other thing right that it it just is either yeah, I mean, I don't even know what else to say beyond that. It's pretty hard to, to be articulate about it. But it couldn't have come from some other reality because then that would already be real. So there isn't, there's nothing for it to come from. But it also doesn't make any sense to say it came from nothing because then you've sort of illicitly treated nothing as if it were a thing, right? It, reality just, it just is, right? So it's ungenerated and imperishable. Like there isn't, there isn't a time after it or a time before it because then you'd be imagining um, some sense of reality that you're putting outside the domain of reality. But the very notion of reality is that it would have to include those things. Right? Um, 
what is is ungenerated and imperishable a whole of a single kind yeah it's it's reality is just reality through and through it just is itself everywhere right um a single kind you could even say of a singular kind like there's nothing you could ever compare it to it's the one and only existence it's being a whole of a single kind unshaken and complete nor was it ever nor will it be since it is now altogether one holding together so so you know with 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 um heraclitus we got that initial remark that uh listening not to me but to the logos it's wise to say all things are one and changing it rests right so i looked at those things to try to get this idea out of like talking about reality as such and then now we see parmenides uh exploring that um a little more richly and like bringing out some more some more things to say about it like when when you do switch to the level about talking about reality on its own terms when you look beyond the familiar differences of everyday life and and grasp something about their inherent dependence on the fact of existing and what it is to be um you you come upon the need to have new ways of thinking new to to approach it with different categories where so as and almost opposite the almost the opposite ones for everyday life from everyday life for for whereas your everyday experience would be there are many if you really think about reality you'd say no there is one um in your everyday experience you operate with the opposition of between is and is not but when you think about reality all you got is is um when you're thinking about uh everyday reality you think in terms of coming to be and passing away but you can't think that way here right um uh yeah so uh i could go on just sort of trying to bring that stuff out but i imagine you get the point and you, you should think about it on your own um but he's giving you a lead here with with how to think about reality on its own terms so i'm going to uh, continue with that in a minute going back to heraclitus and also going to pythagoras but first i want to read one more passage from uh, Par Parmenides, uh, uh, that, that is relevant to the thing I just said. So this is fragment three in the book, which is which is B3. The translation is um, not great. It says, it's a hard one to translate, but this one says, for the same thing is for thinking and for being. Um, uh, um, uh, an older, more traditional translation would be, uh, it's the same thing to think and to be. Um, uh, there, there are a few other ones. It's a, it's a bit of a tricky sentence, but the, the relevant point is, I think, there's a, Parmenides is, is kind of equating what it is, to, in some sense, what it is to be and what it is to think, but by which I don't think he means um, thinking is existing. I think he means when we think, or rather, thinking properly so called is grasping what it is to be so uh, the the word he uses for thinking is is knowing which is a verb related to the noun noose we'll we'll see that especially when we, we get into plato and aristotle we'll see noose knowing noesis a series of words like that those are words that that um in english we're going to translate typically as thinking mind intellect uh, and so on um, um and on that note, I want to go back and read one, reread one um, passage from Heraclitus. This was number eight, B one hundred four. Heraclitus said, "What understanding, noose, or intelligent t intelligence have they? They put their trust in popular bards, take the mob for their teachers." So there, Heraclitus was saying, "Everyday people don't really exercise noose. They don't really think. They let their." interpretation of things they let their way of making sense of things be guided by the kind of categories that come from uh popular artistic media and popular opinion and so on and he's contrasting that with thinking which is this word noose or knowing and i think he's and i think heraclitus is is making the same connection that parmenides is making is that what it really means to think is to grasp things in terms of their character as real 
So it means to understand the terms of reality and to think from those terms. Um, um, another way of putting that same point, but just flipping the emphasis, would be to say, yeah, you can look around with your eyes and ears and hear the person walking and see the person walking down the street and so on. Um, well, what, it, what is right in front of you? Reality. But how do you grasp it? Well, you're always seeing reality. Whenever you're seeing a house, you're seeing reality. Whenever you're seeing a person, you're seeing reality. Whenever you hear a car horn, you're hearing reality. But you're not hearing it as reality, exactly. You're hearing it as a car horn or whatever. What does it take to grasp reality as reality? Well, that is what thinking is. And, and it is, you do it by thinking. There's a distinctive thing that we can do which is that we can relate to what's around us, not merely in terms of the kind of everyday functional way these things confront us, but we can, we have the capacity to take our environments, our, our situations, and um, relate to them as presence of reality as such we can relate to them as real you don't you do that not through looking and listening but through thinking that's what it is to think to to and that's and he's saying that's what intelligence ultimately is intelligence i mean in english we can use the word intelligence to mean a lot of things um let's say let's use the word intellect that's what intellect is it is the grasping of the principles of reality or similarly the grasping of the things around you in terms of the principles of reality rather than just in terms of your familiar practical ways of engaging um, uh, so that's that's metaphysics right that's thinking about the ultimate nature of reality and uh, and having your experience then s subsequently be informed by that understanding uh, yeah, let's. Um, well, that's the thing about human beings. We can do that. I don't think my cat can do that. We can though. We we can we can um, entertain that question of the ultimate nature of reality, and that's the same as saying we're beings who can think. Which is to say, we can take ourselves out of the sort of practical demands of our finite embodied conditions and adopt the perspective of what is absolute right. so let's let's continue with that a little bit and 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 think about what happens when you do that um, let's go very briefly to Pythagoras um, Heraclitus and Parmenides are two figures um, who uh, you know, have these books or poems or whatever, uh, pre pretty, pretty clear, pretty clear cut stuff that they, that they wrote. Um, with Pythagoras, uh, there's no, it's maybe he wrote something, but, but there, there isn't anything that, that exists that we can confidently say is his. He, he himself, he was a bit older than these guys. He was born, uh, I think around 570 BC. So he's in an early, earlier generation and he is a little bit more like a, almost like a priest or a religious leader. Um, uh, he developed a following, uh, uh, and and that following was itself kind of um, well. Let me let me put that differently. He developed a following, and in that way, in a, in a certain respect, he's kind of more like a religious figure. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, the particular things that he's presenting are the kinds of things that I'm just bringing out for you here from Heraclitus and Parmenides, namely the intellectual grasp of the ultimate nature of reality as, as a way of informing our, our immediate experience. But it's not about worshipping a god. It's about understanding reality. Um, so... So that ambiguity in him was actually reflected in a kind of um, 
doubleness of of his followers. He 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 produced a huge tradition of followers, and that in some ways lasted for hundreds of years. Um, but one, but but I'm thinking of the followers in the more immediate time. One one group uh, were called the listeners or something like that, uh, and that meant that they're, they're the ones who had heard. And but it really it really meant uh, the people who the followers who who appreciated his more uh, more religious teachings and more his teachings about lifestyle and were carrying on something like his his inspired mystical insights and then there were the other ones who were called the learners and they were the ones who were carrying on something more like what we might call his scientific investigations into reality um, anyway so as I say he so he's he's a he's a little bit of an uncertain figure he's also associated with um, politics in some uh, interesting ways. It's a, it's a quite an interesting story to pursue, but I'm not going to pursue that. Um, I really just want to bring out one of the most powerful ideas from him, or at least from the Pythagorean tradition, because that's really what we have. We have the, tra the Pythagorean tradition, uh, which was itself heavily oriented towards this kind of concern about the ultimate nature of reality that I was just talking about. But I want to, and I want to pick up on one thing that is uh, a, f a further piece in our story of trying to talk about the ultimate nature of reality. So this, uh, is from the from this pre-Socratic reader, it's it's um, the fragment or whatever passage number sixteen. Uh, it's it's not actually uh, part of the Dilskrant's book, but it's it's um, uh, but it's it's a very it's a very well known and and famous part of the of the Pythagorean legacy. So I'll read it here. It says that the tetractus is a certain number that the, that the Pythagoreans emphasize, uh, which being composed of the four first numbers produces the most perfect number 10. So it's like 1, 2, 3, 4, right? That little pyramid that's four on each side. Uh, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, or 1, 2, 3, 4, or 1, 2, 3, 4, um, and 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10, etc. That, that, that little set of mathematical relations that, that can be captured in that little triangle, that's called the tetractus. Um, he says, yeah, uh, which being composed of the first four numbers produces the most perfect number 10 for 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 come to be 10. That number is the first tetractus and is called the source of ever-flowing nature since... According to them, the Pythagoreans, the entire cosmos is organized according to harmonia, harmony. And harmonia, harmony, is a system of three concords, the fourth, the fifth, and the octave. And the proportion of these three concords are found in the aforementioned four numbers. Um, uh, that, that, comes, that passage comes from a writer uh, from... Uh, I think around 150 AD, if I'm not mistaken, it's Sextus Empiricus. I, I could, I think it's around 150 AD. It's a long time later, 600 years, 700 years later, um, and he, he's part of a very different uh, kind of philosophical school and so on. So, but he's a guy 700 years later writing about Heraclitus, which would be like you or me talking about someone from 1300, let's say. Um, uh, and uh, so it's not exactly. Pythagoras speaking when you get that, but it's a sort of a report of something, and a report of something that Sextus probably doesn't fully understand. I don't fully understand it either, but but there's a basic idea there that I want to bring out, uh, and that's the idea that um, oh, this wind is getting in the way here. Um, um, that basically we we were talking about reality as such, basically what's coming out here is that there is a structure to reality. And going back to the theme of thinking and intelligence, it's an intelligible structure. Reality is something that can be understood, can, can, be, can be thought about and grasped. And I'm gonna, I want to start with the last thing he says. Um, Harmony is a system of three concords, the fourth, the fifth, and the octave, and the proportion of these three concords are found in the aforementioned four numbers. Well, you know, you, uh, there are some sounds uh, in in music that are pretty important: the 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 fourth, the fifth, and the octave. 
So an octave is um, like this. Whoops. Whoops. Those, those are all on the guitar or similarly on the piano. Those notes would all be called D. Well, if I'm in tune. It's a little bit hard to play when I'm sitting here at this table. Um, here's a fifth from D to A or from A to E, from E to B, from B to F sharp. Let's start down on G. Every time I'm playing those things, I'm playing an octave, and I'm imagining that you can hear basically the same interval as what we call it. the same harmonic interval is is being played just at a different pitch level. But so there's a certain relationship that is a fifth. And now here's a fourth. That's a series of fourths. Each one of those is a fourth. That's a fourth. So here's so I'll, I'll give you the fourth, the fifth, and the octave. Here's the fourth, all, all starting on D. D to G is a fourth. D to A is a fifth. D to D is an octave. Um, well, those those are sounds, and and they're called concords because. Generally speaking, people tend to hear those relationships as as fitting. Like the this, if I play that first note, that second note uh, seems to fit with it in a kind of constant way. It seems to fit with it and and bring out something about. It. And the octave is especially that way. It's it's like it's like it's the same note. It's just an octave higher in pitch. Um, so the thing that's interesting about those sounds, which are the sounds that people, generally speaking, think of as especially concordant as opposed to discordant. No, another way to say that is those notes f sound like they're in tune with each other. Whereas I could take... I can't, I don't know if I can... You know what it's, what it's like to have a guitar out of tune. That doesn't sound like a concord. It sounds like a discord. It sounds like a bunch of pitches sounding at the same time that aren't really in tune with each other. You might like it. You might get used to discordant sounds, but it's not like sounds that go and just fit together into a into a tight little hold. It's like all these things sort of sound sort of struggling with each other, which may be aesthetically pleasing, but it's but it's uh, sonically a, con a discord, not a concord. Um, so the thing that so that's that's the first point is that this notion of things being in tune with each other. One of the things that's particularly interesting about the fourth, the fifth, and the octave is that they correspond to some pretty basic and exact uh, mathematical ratios. Um, to make a sound that is a an octave, you can take two things, two stones, or you can stretch a string really tight and make it vibrate, or you could use a tube and get a column of vibrating air. You can do that. You can hit a stone, or you can pluck a tight string, or you can uh, blow in a, in a, in a pipe, um, and you'll get a certain pitch. And to get a pitch that's an octave apart, uh, you just... Um, uh, double the size of the stone you hit, double the length of the column of vibrating air, or double the length of the string, and you'll get it an octave lower. Or you cut it in half, uh, and you'll get it an octave higher. So notes that are an octave apart stand in a relationship of one to two. Or on a guitar, you know, you pluck the string, and it, and, and it uh, makes a sound. If I make, if I pluck this vibrating string, it makes that sound. 
if I put my finger down at exactly the halfway point, it'll make the note that's exactly an octave away. And that's marked on the guitar by the 12th fret. Uh, so you might, if you play the guitar, you might have known that it happens to the 12th fret. You might never have bothered to measure it though. If you do, you'll see it's the halfway point on the string. So now when I put my finger here, the vibrating tight string is only this long, which is half the length of what it was doing when it was vibrating between the nut and the bridge. So, so the point then is that that, that concordant interval of, of an octave which is something you hear and even feel it like you hear the sound but it feels like it fits so something that 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 grips you emotionally or or affectively as well as just sort of sonically corresponds to a, a perfect relationship of these whole numbers two to one um and the the relation of a fifth is a relationship of, of two to three. And the relationship of a fourth is a relationship of, of three to four. But the, the point is, in any case, that if you um, have one thing of weight four and, and the other stone of weight three and you make the sound on them, the sound will be a, different, uh, of, um, a fourth apart. If you have weight three and weight two, the sound will be a fifth apart. If you have weight two and weight one, the sound will be an octave apart. So these concords, these, these things that we perceive in this kind of privileged way as, as notes that, that kind of naturally fit together, also correspond to these perfect whole number ratios, one to two, two to three, and three to four. And that's sort of what this Tractatus it's, that's part of what it's about, or at least that's the most immediate form of, of this thing. So what's what's the point that I'm trying to get that there? That that there in this case there are numbers, there are mathematical relationships that are kind of the essence of certain experiential realities. Um, you don't immediately recognize it. You just like that sound. But what you're what you're really hearing, you know, is three to two, something like that. Um, let's think of another one. Another one associated with Pythagoras, the the so-called Pythagorean theorem. If you have a right angle triangle, um, uh, the the length of the hypotenuse, which would which is the side uh, that that uh, runs opposite. The right angle, the the length of that the square of the length of that side will always be equal to the square of the length of one of the other sides added to the square of the length of the third side. Right, so that hypotenuse we'll call C. The other two sides of the triangle we'll call A and B. And so a, the length A squared plus the length B squared will be equal to the length C squared. And that's the Pythagorean theorem. Um, that's that turns out to be how space works, right? Those those are those are the um, the realities of of uh, spatial relations. You might never have known that, but but it means you know what, what that means is if you're walking down the street and you think, oh, is it farther to go this way or that way? And you think, oh, I think yeah, I think it's 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 going to be longer if I walk that way. It's going to be faster if I walk this straight down this street and then turn right and walk this way like you you could believe because the way it just feels or seems to you that it's going to be shorter to walk in the sort of the zigzag where the fact is the very nature of a space means it's always going to be shorter to walk on the diagonal um, you might not know that but that's the reality of space now, so the, why am i saying you might not know that because the point is even though you are in the presence of that reality and it has an order. You can not know it. Uh, so, um, uh, there, there are truths about the nature of reality that are sort of what what is uh, what it, it is the order of things, and it's what. Um, is setting the rules for your experience. But you can easily participate 
in the world without knowing those things. And so that's why, again, or that's that's like what Heraclitus says then, to go back to that. Um, he said, eyes and ears are bad witnesses to people if they have barbarian souls, or uncomprehending when having heard they are like the deaf. The saying describes them present, they are absent. Um, you know, the, the point is, you or that or the one I began with actually. What understanding or news have they? They put their trust in popular bobs and bar, bards and take the mob for their teacher. Or actually, the one I really started with, the one he starts with. Although the logos holds sway, people prove unable to understand it both before hearing it and when they first heard it. And although all things come to be in accordance with it, humans are like the inexperienced when they experience such words. Blah blah. So you know, his, the point throughout all of that is that. These these things Pythagoras has just been showing us about the mathematical um, core or structure of reality is true, and it's what's really in front of you. You know, you're really hearing the ratio of two to one. You're really hearing what two and one sound like. Um, you're really when you're walking in space, you really are dealing with the things that the Pythagorean theorem speaks to, and that you know Euclid specified a little bit later um, uh, but you easily might not know that and you could be very you could be very wrong you can be very wrong in your relationship to the world because you don't exercise your noose that that noose or knowing that you don't you don't ex you don't guide yourself by thinking where thinking means turning away from your familiar engagement with everyday things and the terms of everyday life that you get from bards and the mob, and instead committing yourself to the rigorous practice of using intelligence to grasp the nature of reality as such and to see how that explains and dictates the... the the nature and the real meaning of everyday things. Um, uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. That was the first point I wanted to make, and um, there, so there I wanted to, you know, I went back 2,500 years and talked about this notion of inauguration, and here I really wanted to intro to 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 introduce this idea of metaphysics, or rather to say. This is the Greeks introducing the notion of metaphysics, or which is to say, introducing the rigorous process of thinkingly comprehending the nature of reality as such, asking the question of reality as such, recognizing that there is such a thing as reality as such, and um, taking that the very fact, you know, of existing as their theme, of being as their theme. And um, trying to uh, query it and try to grasp the nature of being as such. I wanted to introduce that, and I wanted to introduce some of the things that come from that by looking at a little bit of Heraclitus, um, a little bit of Parmenides, and a little bit of Pythagoras to start getting the idea of what 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 are the terms you have to use when you talk about reality as such. Well, they're different terms from the terms you talk about when you talk about everyday things. Right, we got that mostly from Parmenides. And then with Pythagoras, to think a little bit more about that and to see us start specifying the, the sort of internal logic uh, or the, the logos, as, as uh, Heraclitus says, of, of the, the, the ultimate nature of things. So I'm going to leave that there. And then next time we're going to come back, we're going to return to Heraclitus a little bit to look at a, a, a little bit more of his sort of distinctive contribution to that and then go from there to talking about the second chorus from Sophocles' play Antigone. Um, quite a different kind of writing. That's theatrical, a theatrical performance. But that, that little uh, choral ode is pretty philosophically rich and powerful and it, and it will kind of naturally follow from what we're doing. So that will be our next, our next stop on this journey.